Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here. Today I'm going to explain why economic collapse is inevitable using just two charts. So let's go there right now. This is episode 88, recording here on December 13th, 2022. What are those two charts? First, we have this one. This is chart number one right here. This is a chart of total debt in the United States compared to gross domestic product. So hold that thought. The second chart is this one, which comes from my new book down there, The Crash Course, uh, which is coming out in February. So if you pre-order, I would appreciate it. It'd be great. We'd love to get that up the charts. Now, this is global GDP. That's the global economy, gross domestic product across the world compared to oil consumption. Now, what did these charts have to do with each other? Well, it turns out lots. So let me set this up for you. First, my motto in these stories is I'd much rather be a year early then a day late, particularly when it comes to life-changing, economy-shattering information like this. I do what I do at Peak Prosperity here out in public because I want people to be prepared. I want you to be prepared. I don't want you to be unprepared. I think there's ample evidence that the world is unraveling and it's going to continue to unravel. And I'm going to show you why today. And I'm going to tell you why I think the WEF, the Davos crowd, team elite, however we think of the people who are out there doing what they're doing, I, I know why they're doing what they're doing because they have access to the same data I'm gonna bring you today. And when you see it this way, it's kind of a red pill moment. It's like, oh, if that's really true, then wow, lots of implications. So this is what it's gonna look like. Now, in the crash course, what I do is I endeavor to bring together three separate things at once because I'm a systems level thinker. I can't think of you know, all the details involved in the economy and knowing about little minutia and having to do like differential calculus to solve for how consumers behave. Uh, no, nah. I think about the economy as a large, large block and I compare that large block and what I know about it to the world of energy. Now, I'm a biologist sort of by training, I guess, you know, my, I'm in the biological sciences. It's where my PhD came from. So I'm, I'm very conversant in statistics and how animals work and organisms. And because of that, I have a really good sense of what energy means to an economy as, as a living organism or to myself as a living organism or to any living organism. I get it, right? If you have energy, you can be a complex system like my body that's functioning, like your body. Those are complex systems. So if we want to understand the complex system of the economy, we have to understand the role of energy as it flows through that economy and supports it. So that's what I do. I connect those two dots there and also the environment, the third E in the story or ecology. Because if you have your energy system working great and it's supporting your economy, but you kill the environment and you destroy your ecology, no bueno. Similarly, if all you do is just preserve the ecology, but you don't make sure that people can still live, well, it's called Haiti and it doesn't actually preserve the ecology at all at the end of the day. Hungry people eat everything. So you have to keep all three of these things in balance. Remember when I was talking about COVID, I also mentioned that there was a balancing act there that seemed obvious to me, but obviously escaped our erstwhile leaders, health leaders and authorities who didn't understand the various trade-offs and things like that that you need to make. You have to think about these things from a system standpoint. There are no either ors. It's all kind of both and both this and that are true. Both we don't want our hospitals to be overrun and people need to work and eat and we want our children to develop normally and on and on, right? Okay, so this is the framework I use. And so uh, honestly, I really love this quote by Leonardo da Vinci who said, learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. And it's really true. So if you don't know how these three pieces, economy, energy, environment, fit together, you owe it to yourself to figure it out because there's a huge story here. And once you see it this way, like thousands of my followers, you will suddenly go, oh, why did I not see it that way before? Well, lots of reasons. Our press, our universities, do they go out of their way not to connect these dots in the way that well, you would find very useful if you saw them connected this way. So first chart, here's the first chart. I said, I'm gonna do this in two charts. On top, this is total credit market debt, uh, all sectors, right? This is student debt, household debt, credit card debt. Um, we got state debt, municipal debt, federal debt, corporate debt. It's everything that's actually debt, not liabilities. Liabilities 
are things that you know you're going to owe some money in the future, but you haven't set any money aside yet. This would be Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the children who you think are going to go to college in your family who you haven't begun to save for yet, the you know, the roof that you haven't repaired, you know it's got to be repaired, all liabilities, things in the future that are going to cost you money, but aren't actually debt yet today. This chart is all debt today, just debt. That's the orange line on the top. In red trunks, in the other corner down below, we have gross domestic product. Now, I think you can immediately intuit that there's a problem going on here which is if we call the red line, gross domestic product, our national income, and we compare our income to our debts, if this was a household, you'd say, wow, you have a problem on your hands. Let's go get some credit counseling for you because your income is rising at one rate, but your debts are rising at another rate. Now, what happens when you get way over the tips of your skis and you have too much debt? Well, the first thing is you're technically in a moment of insolvency when your debts cannot be repaid out of current operations. Now, that doesn't mean bankruptcy yet. Insolvency is a different word from bankruptcy. Insolvency is a condition when your liabilities exceed your assets and your income, and there's nothing you can do about that. Bankruptcy is the legal proceeding that follows that when all the vultures descend and the, get into the court system and decide how they're going to divvy up the fragments that do remain of your assets and spread those hopefully equitably across all the liability holders of your particular liabilities. All right, so this we have a problem. So right here, just in one chart, if somebody said, Chris, I'll give you one chart in a minute, why is the United States in trouble? I'll say because it's addicted to having its debt constantly growing faster than its economy. Now that's a problem. Sooner or later we have a math problem. Now this math problem is barreling down on us so when we hear things like, hey, the, the Davos crowd is calling for a great reset, a great reset is another term for a restructuring, right? So what happens when you are technically insolvent and hurtling towards bankruptcy? Well, we know we have a restructuring in our future at some point, and we have to do that in one way or another. We'll either do it honestly or dishonestly, right? A, a dishonest restructuring is to just create lots of inflation, pretend you don't know where it's coming from, and let that pain of the inflation eat its way across everybody's bank account, but falling more heavily, of course, on the poor and the middle classes regressively, um, in an attempt to make that those two lines come back together again a little bit because the debt stays fixed in old dollars, but those new dollars are worth a lot less, so it actually erodes the value of the existing debt. Okay, that's one way. Um, but it also steals purchasing power from everybody's bank account. Now, the honest way to go about this would be to say, wow, we have a problem here and we're going to have to, we live beyond our means for a while. That's what a chart like this says. A chart like this is, we're living beyond our means. When you are borrowing and spending more than you have, you're living beyond your means. We would understand this colloquially in a, hey, you know what, I'm just going to take this suit trip around the world and put it on my credit card. Great lifestyle. I'm living well. However, beyond my means, if I've quit my job and I'm just burning through my savings and then piling it up on credit. That's what this is. That's what this story says right here, very clearly, unequivocally. Now, the only other honest way to get out from a chart like this, to get out from under it, is to grow your way out from under it. So, you know, does it really matter, Chris, that we have all that debt? If we could just get the economy to grow real fast, and then it'll make that debt, it'll pay that debt back. Okay, that's a fair point. Now, next question is, where does economic growth actually come from? Now, what do we mean when we say economic growth? Well, I mean, we understand it in terms of everything we read, right? Economic growth means if we sold a million car units this year, we would sell a million and 100,000 for 10% growth. That would get tacked onto the GDP. So selling more cars next year than this year leads to economic growth. Selling more new homes next year than this year leads to economic growth. Having a larger government budget that's spending more next year than this year leads to what we perceive to be economic growth, although that's not actually economic growth in that case because um, the government's deficit spending. Longer story, I'll get back to that in just a second, some other episode. But economic growth just means we're more goods, more services. We're, we're consuming more things next year or next period of time than this year. 
So think about every one of those things I just mentioned, whether it's, um, you know, you're getting a massage from somebody, you're getting some service from a lawyer. Those are all service examples. Or we have bought more widgets from China. We bought cars, solar systems, maybe wind towers, maybe uh, more corn, whatever it is. Each one of those things, when we look at it, we go down one layer, we discover that the creation, the mining, the movement, the transformation, the transport of every single thing in our economy relies on energy. This is where energy sneaks back into the story. So we have an economy, but it's not just this little thing in a bubble doing what it does all by itself. It's actually completely 100% reliant on energy flowing through the system. So if we said, listen, we're going to try and get out from under this debt perilous debt situation, Chris, that you've just described, but we're going to do it honestly. We're going to grow. We're not going to do it dishonestly and just print money and steal from everybody or default on everything and give everybody universal basic income and central bank digital currencies and squish their lives down, which is enforced austerity, which is a dishonest way to go about this. If we're going to do it honestly, the story is we're going to grow our way out from under all that debt. So that story requires two components. First, that you don't keep piling on new debt faster than that growth can appear, right? If if you have your debt there, you'd like to hold it constant and then grow your economy up into it, then it goes away, all right? That's way one. Way two, uh, thing two about this is that, how does that growth even happen? Where does it come from? Now, fortunately, we have the answer. We go to chart number two in this story and that, um, oh, before we get there, I forgot I had this chart in there. Very important. This is just that same debt chart. Do you see that orange line on the top? I've just stripped away. All we have is the blue line here, which is the same debt chart, right? Total credit market debt in the United States. And you see that little number, the R squared, and says 0.97. There's a little dotted line on that chart. I do this for fun. There's a fourth honorary E in my story besides economy, energy, environment, and that's exponential growth. So what that blue dotted line is, is a mathematical curve fit, an exponential curve fit for the United States debt, starting from the period of 1951 through to, I think this chart comes through about 2020. And it asks the question, hey, how nearly perfectly did U.S. debt accumulate compared to an exponential function? And the answer is, well, with about 97.8% explanatory power, an exponential curve fit is a perfect description of the system. So we know that our debt is growing exponentially. Corollary to that, if your debt's growing exponentially, what is the implicit and even explicit assumption about your economy? Well, it has to be growing exponentially too, and kind of at the same rate if they're gonna stay equal with each other over time. So, and by the way, the average doubling time since 1952 is 8.8 years. Every 8.8 years, there's twice as much debt in the US system, okay. Fine. What does that mean? It means this. We have to keep growing our economy exponentially or one of these things just get away from each other and things go really bad. And then you do have a great reset, either one that was imposed by nature or self-imposed by your ruling elites. Now, here's where the story gets a little funk do. This is the crash chart number two. We, now we have to connect this. On the left chart, going up that axis, starting from zero up to 120, in trillions is global GDP. So if we went up that left axis, 20 trillion in global GDP, then 40, then 60, then 80. And this starts all the way back about 1975 on this particular chart. And then it's mapping something and it's asking the question across the X axis on the bottom, how many thousands of barrels of oil per day? So 50,000 barrels of oil on the left side of that X axis would be what? Well, that's 50 million barrels of oil per day consumed. And then 60 million barrels, 70, 80, 90, and so on. Now, what this chart shows us is that from 1975 through to 2021, there was, again, uh, a relationship, but this time a linear relationship between the amount of GDP and the amount of oil that was getting burned. And it's such a good relationship with a 93% fit that we can say, well, there's a pretty tight relationship there. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if we're going to build another house, what has to happen? Well, somebody's got to cut some trees down. Somebody's got to mine some gypsum and turn it into sheetrocks. A lot of trucks have to go here and there. People have to show up. Things have to happen. All of that requires oil. If we want to manufacture a new car, taking it from the process of mining mining ores out of the ground to refine metals, 
to the point where a car is actually sold, there's a lot of oil involved, right? So again, this chart is just saying something that if you want your global GDP to expand, well, you need your oil consumption to expand. And it's been absolutely pretty much rock solid true since about 1975 through current that this is the relationship. It's just data. It's just a fact of how things happen to actually work. So, so when we go back a chart and we say, okay, well, this chart's kind of expecting us to double our debt every 8.8 years. This chart's saying we've been doing it with the expectation that someday GDP is going to catch up. But if GDP depends on oil production, then we have an important question to ask, which is, okay, is there enough oil production to carry this forward for another 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 years? How, how long can this persist? How long can we depend on this? And what happens when we can't depend on that? Things break down, what happens? Nobody really knows, but I've got a pretty good idea how this breaks out. This is just a different way to present that second chart. Maybe this one makes more sense to you, so I'll present it this way. On the y-axis, we have more GDP going this way. This is a log chart from 0, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, like that. This is 2017 GDP, and this is more oil consumption. Again, log from going from 0.001 to 0.01 to 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100. And so what happens is, you see that nice straight line? Every single dot on here is a country, and it gets dotted on there based on how big its GDP is and how much oil it consumed. So it gets a dot, right? And you see here, all the so-called richest countries are way up there on the right end because they burn the most oil. And that means they have the most GDP. That's the relationship. So GDP is proportional to oil consumption. Now, I got this chart here from my good friend Art Berman of Labyrinth Consulting. It's a great chart. It really captures it because it shows you the relationship. Now, this is just in 2017. So this is just one snapshot in time. This is asking the question in 2017, what was the answer? Let me put a line out there with countries plotted according to how much oil they burned and how high their GDP was. And you get this chart. Hopefully, again, it's very easy to see. There's a relationship here and it's a really strong relationship. This chart, on the other hand, is plotting over long stretches of time, global economy against global oil consumption. So it shows you that it it's been true since 1975. So that's a very long time. And it's true on any given year when we take a snapshot. I'm just trying to drive home the point. The economy and oil consumption are tightly linked. That's the data I just showed you, but it's also intuitively sensible, right? Because as you look out into a city and all of its economic activity, and you maybe look at it at night, what you'll probably see is a lot of energy being evap dissipated into the universe, right? There's lights everywhere and cars going all over the place and ships coming in if it's on the coast. It's all energy. So when we stop thinking about the economy as this thing that happens because the Federal Reserve pulls some magic levers and throws more or less cash out into the system and start thinking about it as an energy dissipating machine, it makes a lot more sense. So humans take diffuse ores out of the ground, we concentrate them using a lot of energy, and we turn them into things like hmm, silicon chips and, you know, uh, copper wire and flat screen TVs and things like that. So, but it all relies on energy. So Again, if we look at this just um, in slightly different way, but again, this is against total energy in the world, total energy, not just oil. Those other charts were just plotting GDP against oil consumption. This is plotting, in this case, energy consumption against GDP across the x-axis this time. You can see a nice flat line. This is a really powerful insight. And by the way, this entire time, 80% plus or minus 1% has come from fossil fuels. So that's where they come from. Could they come from somewhere else? Maybe, but they haven't yet. 80% still to this day is coming from fossil fuels. So big, big thing. Now, um, before I go on, I do want to say that uh, Mike had just uh, stood up for us last time, this idea that people can buy us coffees. And people bought, bought me some coffees last time. Thank you so much for doing that. Anonymous, 20 coffees. 
You're the man. I love that. Someone bought me a coffee. Joe Taz4 bought a coffee. George uh, Nebenzal, thank you. Thank you all for buying coffees uh, here at the site on, on, um, uh, that's on YouTube. That's awesome. And as well, from the last episode, which was uh, what's up with those mysterious blood clots, uh, got a lot of really good attention for that. And um, uh, I'm in touch, actually, with some of the now with, with some of the, the uh, embalmers who were in charge of that. So I'm, I'm learning a lot, a lot more about this. And it's, it's just a really good story. But I liked Amy Badger said, as a paramedic with experience dealing in the care of suicidal patients, I will give my professional opinion that this content creator appears in no way to be psychologically unstable or likely to harm himself. Just saying. <laughs> it's true. I am totally stable, happy, got a great relationship, and uh, live in a great, good place. So that's where I am. Um, and so, yeah, some other people said some really nice things here. So thank you, Marco Day. Thank you, Amgis. Thank you, I see Fubar, like the name. All right. Thanks, everyone, for the support. I love it. I love hearing from you. I do read the comments and, and try to find out, hey, am I hitting the mark or not? Love to know. All right. So in that whole story, then, where are we? So what's the problem? The problem here is that I grew up at a time when there was always more and more of this fossil fuel energy around. And that era is drawing to a close. And that's what's causing a lot of the skittishness that you see out there. The world feels confusing. It's like nobody knows what's going on. It sort of has that World War I, nobody knows exactly why an Archduke getting shot is going to create like, you know, the conflagration that, that kills millions. It's because there are moments in time when humans get skittish and things break down for reasons that aren't completely obvious or clear. This is one of those times. And again, from a biological standpoint, I believe that we are an organism. We are wired to understand when resources are flush and when it's time to move to the next valley, maybe where there's thicker pickings for our food and things like that. Well, there's no next valley in this story anymore. There's nowhere to go. There's no like escape valve like, like there was. Like you could go in the 40s and 50s, you could still go to another country where the resources had basically not been tapped. That is no longer the case. In fact, we're coming up on a really amazingly huge, potentially dangerous moment of history for humans, not U.S., not China, not India. And it's around the idea of where we really stand in the resource story and the relationship of that to this beautiful, wonderful, comfy life that we've all built for ourselves around the economy as it's fashioned. So I care about this a lot because as bad as COVID was, it's going to be child's play compared to the amount of pain and, and hurt that's going to happen if or when the economy collapses. Now, I started this whole thing saying, well, it looks to me like the economy is going to collapse. And I make that statement um, for a number of reasons. What we are in is this. We're in what's called an interregnum. An interregnum is a period when normal government is suspended, especially between successive reigns or regimes. The old king is dead. Which son or uncle will assume the throne? We don't know. It's an awkward, uncomfortable period. Nobody quite knows where the new power structure lies. You don't know if you're like good as gold or if you're about to lose your head, right? It's a, the interregnum is a really awkward period of time, and it's really when you're between stories. So the old story was, yeah, the world's limitless. We'll just take whatever fossil fuels we need. We don't have to worry about species and things like that. Nature seems to take care of herself and rebalances herself. So, so we can basically ignore all that stuff as we pursue the really exciting stuff of economic growth. And we pursued that as a species with a lot of vigor. And here we are. And we can see that story is breaking down. And it's getting awkward and uncomfortable. And nobody quite knows where the new story is going. And we don't know what this new story is yet because the successor hasn't been chosen yet. So we're in the interregnum. And you see people doing kind of strange stuff in that in middle time, right? People seem to be confused about gender. They're confused about whether they should splash tomato soup on Van Gogh paintings as a means of expressing their discomfort. Um, we see people checking out. We see people doing all kinds of stuff. At least part of that, I think, can be explained by this awkwardness of this time, which is the old story of perpetual economic growth. It's over. And the only people who don't know that yet are people who haven't really looked at it or who have some belief structure that's preventing them from looking at it because they don't want it to be true because they're just about to retire and it would really be awkward for them if it turned out to be true or they don't want to think about what would happen if it's going to be true or not. 
listen, as always, there are rapid adjusters and then there are slower adjusters. So in this story, if you can get your mind around this particular story of what's going to happen to the economy when, not if, but when there isn't ever more oil to support it while we're still printing, 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 printing. If you can wrap your head around that, hey, you can skate to where that puck is going to be and you can begin to protect yourself, protect your family, protect your business, make different choices, make better choices, make faster choices around what you need to do. But first, you have to wrap your head around this macro sort of systems level story that I've got for you here. So interregnum, that's where we are. And um, the dream, the dream we're holding is that we're going to go to this new alt energy tech future, kind of fun, right? A lot of windmills, some solar panels, uh, who knows, but there's going to be a lot of technology in there. And maybe this fusion thing you just maybe heard about, that's the dream. And the reality is, Maybe we get here instead. Maybe we just, you know, use up the earth before we manage to pull off a big energy transition. Longer story about why I don't think we're going to get to an energy transition, at least not without a lot of disruption. Has to do with time scale cost. It's a larger story, but it's an important one. At any rate, the reality is we may not get to that dream before the reality begins to bite us. And so here we are. Now, this just came out, and I want to just take you through it because I'll show you what I do, in it, you know, especially for my subscribers at Peak Prosperity is it's not about the content. I don't, what I talk about is less important than how. The how is a system of thinking that I came across that I was, you know, uh, graciously granted by my instructors through time that I learned. I, I like to teach people how to see things. So we're going to go through an example of that with this thing that just came out. So for everybody who wanted or who wants fusion power to be true, this article was just a breath of fresh air. I was like, oh, my God, in the Financial Times, fusion energy breakthrough by U.S. scientists boosts clean power hopes. Awesome. And by the way, I'll be a huge fan if we can get that going. But we need other nuclear first thorium fourth generation pebble bed, like bring it, like we need that stuff like right away and we should be having it. Here's that article in the Financial Times. They write here, quote, U.S. government scientists have made a breakthrough in the pursuit of limitless zero carbon power by achieving a net energy gain in a fusion reaction for the first time, according to three people with knowledge of this, a net energy gain. So if you put in one unit of energy, and you get 0.8 back, uh, you're still lost. A net energy gain means we put in a unit and we got more than one unit back. That is indeed exciting because if you can get a net energy gain from fusion, game on, folks. I mean, that's amazing. That's awesome. That's what they just said happened. But did it? Let's read a little deeper, see what we come up with. Okay, this is at LLL, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California, and they're using inertial confinement fusion. Hey, this is a big giant machine, lots of lasers, huge magnets. And, um, quote, although many scientists believe fusion power stations are still decades away, the technology's potential is hard to ignore. Fusion reactions emit no carbon, produce no long-lived radioactive waste, and a small cup of the hydrogen fuel could theoretically power a house for hundreds of years. This is fusion, not fission. This is what we're talking about, taking two hydrogen atoms, parking them together, overcoming their, their uh, desire not to be together. And then once they do, they come together quite gleefully once you get past that barrier, uh, fusion barrier, and then you create helium. So that's it. That's all you get. The byproduct of this reaction is a lot of heat and helium. Cool idea. Okay, carrying on. The U.S. breakthrough comes as the world wrestles with high energy prices. Whew, right in time, right? And the need to rapidly, rapidly move away from burning fossil fuels to stop average global temperatures reaching dangerous levels. Okay, that's how they write it. I read the whole thing. This is, it's in the same tone. There's no extra real details provided in this. Just like, wow, we have a net energy gain. Thankfully, it comes at just the right time right when we needed a big breakthrough because we're struggling with high prices, plus we got to move away from these fossil fuels anyway, which we do, but because we're running out of them as much as because we think we should stop burning them for climate change. I wonder which of those reasons is actually the thing driving that narrative more. I have my philosophies about that, which I'll share back at Peak Prosperity. So that's the story. There it is. 
Sounds great. Let's dive in. Um, so nine years ago, this this insight here comes to me from Javier Blas uh, on Twitter. I'm going to quote from him next. But he said, you know, this sounds kind of familiar because wasn't it just nine years ago? Oh, yeah, look, in February of 2014, the same crew at the same laboratory had this very exciting announcement that said laser fusion experiment extracts net energy from fuel. Well, wait a minute. I thought they already did this then. Quote, um, they say they have, for the first time, extracted more energy from controlled nuclear fusion than was absorbed by the fuel to trigger it. Ooh, ooh. Here's the how. Here's how we think about this. So that's kind of so. So the laser energy coming in has a certain energy value, and now they were claiming that that they actually created more energy than was absorbed. Well, a lot of that laser energy wasn't absorbed by the pellets, so they might have used a hundred units of laser energy, and maybe five were absorbed, and then they got six back. So was that a good thing? Ah, it's advancement, but it's like we used a hundred, and we lost ninety-four and got six back though, and it only absorbed five. So that was a little. They're, 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 they're you know, a little loose. They're, it's the, the devil's in the details. But that was nine years ago. Hey, sounds like they made a big breakthrough. So what did they do? So here's Javier saying, first, quote, if confirmed, the breakthrough is quite important, which I agree, putting the world into the realms of fusion ignition and perhaps in the future into a sustained and controlled fusion reaction. which would be awesome. Sustained is a key word there. The current experiment lasted for a fraction of a second. Mm, maybe about 400 millionths of a second, but you know, uh, just, yeah, a fraction of a second. Carrying on, quote, there are a few extra caveats. What net energy means in this context? The lasers used by the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory are extremely inefficient. So although the experiment produced net energy compared to what the laser delivered, the lasers consumed a lot more before to charge. Huh? The experiment released 2.5 megajoules versus 2.1 megajoules of laser energy in. But due to inefficiencies, the lasers consumed 330 megajoules to be charged up in the first place with the energy stored in 3,840 high voltage capacitors for 60 seconds before being released in a 400 microsecond burst. Ah, so in fact, instead of putting one unit in and getting 1.1 or two units back, what happened was actually 132 times less energy was produced than was actually consumed to power the lasers so that they could deliver the amount of laser juice. So again, little sophistry here, devil's in the details. Okay, um, you know, not exactly what we were hoping for based on what we read in the Financial Times article. Carrying on, Javier says, but even with those, even by those caveats, the experiment's a massive scientific breakthrough. But don't think you're about to enjoy free and clean energy tomorrow or next year or in 20 years or perhaps even 50 years. Commerciality is far, far away, if ever, many obstacles remain, including one example, the current lasers used in the experiment can fire at best only once a day. For commerciality, they will need to fire several times per second. That's a sign of the many and further breakthroughs that are needed to secure clean and free energy. Should we spend some billions in fusion research when fission energy is readily available? Yes, we should, but we should, too, keep building fission nuclear power plants. I agree. Javier always nails it. Good job, Javier. Once again, when I want to find something out, I turn to Javier and he, he lays it down. So that's actually this, the reality of this. So we have this hype coming out, and my concern is the hype prevents people, good people, from really grasping the actual seriousness of the situation we're in. We don't have 10 or 20 or 50 years to figure out if fusion's gonna work. We have a predicament staring at us right now, which is this extraordinary gap opening up between printing of money and not being able to get more oil out of the ground. And this is something that's happening in the United States, and obviously Russia's not gonna be pumping any more this year, and we got Saudi Arabia saying that they're at their production capacity cap, which is another fancy way of saying peak oil. We have signs all over the place, folks, that we are at something called peak oil. And this is a big deal. Doesn't mean running out, but it certainly doesn't mean that the old story is going to apply where, hey, we need more oil. It comes out of the ground. Now we are geologically constrained, not monetarily or economically constrained. It's just now we got geology. 
And I talked to a lot of people in the oil biz. This is a real deal. This is where we're at. And part of the reason for that is because of this. Um, it takes a lot of money to get oil out of the ground. And here we are back in, uh, I think this was in 2020, they put this chart together and they said that since 2014, energy capital expenditures, that's CapEx, has declined as these ESG concerns rose. You can see here that if this was sort of like, I just eyeballed this, but if we were sort of doing 50, 50 units of investment right here, now we're bet maybe half that through this whole period. It takes money to get oil out of the ground, lots of money, lots and lots, and we've been putting less and less in. Hey, even if we decided tomorrow, let's put lots and lots back in, oil's a long, slow cycle. You start investing today, and if you find a big field, five, six, seven years down the road, you'll get peak, oil, you know, maximum production out of that field. That you, If it's a good field, you can sustain it for decades. But what I'm saying is we haven't put the money in. So even if tonight where the, the world is like, let's find more oil fast, it doesn't work that way. It just takes time. This is already in the rear view mirror. This is investment that has not happened. This is going to create future supply shortfalls. At the exact same time, we're watching the world's major central banks still keep financial conditions e very, very easy. I know you've been hearing about them raising rates, but it's actually, there's a whole story there. It's actually a little bit of smoke and mirrors and a lot of fraud, what they're doing right now, compared to what raising rates used to mean. All right, so that's a problem, that's a predicament, that's where we are at, and so, hi. Have you heard about our two-part series at Peak Prosperity? If not, it's something you really need to know about. Every week I distill the most relevant information and connect dots in my own unique way. Now, in a world that continues to change at an alarming pace, with the knowledge I provide, you can make better and more informed decisions for yourself, for your family, for your business. Best of all, I give you the gift of time. I notice events well before they become common knowledge. Now the first part is always free to the public. The second part is for paying members. I let loose, I say what's on my mind, sometimes I even swear. My favorite part about our paying community though is that it's a 100% free speech zone and also a troll free zone. Civility and intelligence abound. We all learn from each other as we speak our minds freely. So come give us a try. What have you got to lose? And the one thing I wish everybody knew about the economy is this that our economy is founded on debt-based money. And that debt-based money is either happily expanding exponentially or it's busy collapsing or threatening to collapse. It's not a stable system. Two modes, exponentially expanding or collapsing. And my evidence for that comes from a simple line of thinking, which is this. First, what is money? I mean, what is money? Come on, I mean, digits on a hard disk that have your name on them. It might be a physical dollar bill in your wallet or a euro or something like that. But money is actually, it's just a construct. It's a social agreement. So money is a claim on real things. Like my hundred dollar bill I might have in my wallet does not actually, it's got almost no value, no intrinsic value. It has value because you and I agree it has value and I might trade it for something. And well, like what? Like cars, food, houses, people's time. So money is a claim on things. Right? It's actually a claim on people's time. It's a claim on real things, right? which means I can use money to exert that claim and take possession or use of those things. So that's what money is. So when I said this, though, we have an, a, an economy is founded on debt-based money. What is it about debt-based money? What? There, you know, there are money systems that aren't debt-based. Ours happens to be. In fact, all of them in the world are right now. But the reason that's critical is because debt itself is now a claim on future money, like a mortgage, right? A mortgage is a claim on cash flows for however many years you, that mortgage is for. Let's say you take a mortgage out tonight, 30-year mortgage. What does that mean? It means every month for 30 years worth of months, you are going to be having a claim. That mortgage is a claim on that monthly number of cash, right? So that's what, so debt's a claim on future money and money is a claim on real things. So I guess we can transitively tuck those together and say, debt is a claim on future stuff. Did you follow? If money is a claim on real things and debt is a claim on future money, then debt is actually a claim on future real things. So if we have exponentially growing amounts of debt, that means by definition, 
we have the expectation there's going to be an exponentially larger amount of stuff out in the future. You know, stuff, cars, houses, people's time, things like that. So the issue becomes this then. Well, you know, this little wiggle right here, this is where debt for the first time in this data series actually dared to go backwards for a tiny period of time before they crammed it higher again. That was the emergency. That was the wiggle that almost destroyed the world's financial system. Hank Paulson, then Treasury Secretary of the United States. Um, Mervyn King, then exchequer, uh, or no, he was the governor of the Bank of England at that time, right? Um, they both had autobiographies where they said, it was really dicey. The whole world system almost blew up. Like it, it almost blew up. Why did it almost blow up? Because debt for the first time in the series went backwards instead of forwards, right? Crazy, but that's the system we have. So that's my evidence that we have a debt-based monetary system that is either happily expanding exponentially or it's busy threatening to collapse, if not doing that in reality. That's the system we have. And of course, the piece of that that's really um, disturbing is that doesn't seem like anybody at the Federal Reserve or at Davos or anywhere has publicly at least admitted to or thought through this idea of saying, if our money system has to grow exponentially forever and our debts have to grow exponentially forever, doesn't that imply that our economy has to grow exponentially forever and we can't find the energy we're going to use to satisfy that last condition? So what happens? Well, what happens is because the energy provides the real stuff that makes our economy it be what, is, what it is, because that's the actual input that matters the most, not the amount of money, but the amount of real stuff that gets created through the use and application and consumption of real energy. Once you see that you don't have enough of this to create exponentially more of it, but you're creating lots and lots more money, that's a gap that's opening up. That's the gap that's widened out right now. That is why we have inflation today. That's why we're going to have a lot more inflation tomorrow. And it's why the economy is going to collapse because we're going to, we, the authorities are just going to continue to push and push and push this model, the old model, not the new one we got to get to. They're going to push the old model because it's what they know and it's where their jobs come from and their sense of entitlement and power and ego and greed and all that other stuff, all wrapped up in the old story. They'd very much like it to keep going but it can't. Not for a personal reason either. We're just running out of the energy we need. What is personal is that nobody seems to be connecting those dots. Like, well, hold on, what happens to our economic system? And by extension, really, honestly, I'm asking our financial system. If it turns out a lot of people wake up and go, you know what? What if we can't pay all those debts back? Ah, now we're down to the great reset concept. This is my construct for it. My understanding of it is because the physical reality of the world we're in right now says that the old model, okay, we've run it to its conclusion. There is no possible way to square that circle and pay off all those debts. Ain't going to happen. Since it's not going to happen, the only question to resolve is who's going to eat the losses. Now, sadly, turns out team elite, the wealthy, tend to own all of the claims, all of the debts and all of that. Preferentially, there's billionaires, close to trillionaires now, people who just like own, ton they own all those claims. They're the ones who are going to suffer and lose a lot of their status and power if we do this the honest way. So the dishonest way, of course, is the other option. And that's where we get into this whole concept of the Great Reset and all of that. And I believe there's different levels of people who are operating within this. You've got your useful idiots. You've got your greedy, willing participants. You've got your people with higher ambitions and people with, you know, bigger dreams of converting us into gods through technology. Whatever, a lot of players in this. But I've just shared with you what I believe to be the main driver of this story, which is that we simply can't keep operating the old system for much longer as it has been configured so we need a new system. And that's the story that's coming forward. Now that's what I do at Peak Prosperity. That's what I share with everybody. Today we're going to be really carrying this line of thinking further for my members over at Peak Prosperity. We're gonna be talking about this, who and what we're really up against. I gave you the construct for why I think there's a good reason for people to say, we need a great reset. I don't disagree with the what, but how they're going about it and what their plans are now, that's a whole nother story. So we'll be talking about that over at Peak Prosperity. Come on by if you want to check that out. Love to have you there.
A um, lot of very interesting collegial people having wide open free speech discussions. So come on by, check it out. See you there. Until then, please act on this information. Skate to where that puck is going to be. This is really critical information I've just shared with you. All right, that's all I have for you at this moment. We'll be back in the future. Can't wait to talk with you again. And again, love your comments. Bye.